Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing, bro? Alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum, everybody in the chat. Um, welcome to book club. So this is the first. Um, I don't know how many it's going to be. It's going to be a lot in it for this. Let's be neck. Yeah, it depends how much we get through, but they don't have to be too long. Um, you just try and keep a minimum. It takes as long as it takes. Yeah. So it, obviously we're playing things by ear because usually this kind of thing's done on Discord, isn't it? So we're trying it here to see how it plays out. Yeah. Um, so what I've decided to do is I'm going to make the streams going to remain live. I'm going to switch off comments during the read. Then afterwards, members will um, have the basically the permission or the ability to comment. We can invite um, people on to talk as well, isn't it, Yusuf? Yeah, of course. Yeah. If they want to jump on the, on the stream, inshallah. So so right now it's live, so everyone can watch it. It's not a problem. So anyone who's complaining, oh, I can't watch it, I can't become a member, or you know, in your country or whatever, I can't do anything about that. You know what I mean? It's just this is a member's perk. We've been promising it for I've been promising it for months and months that this is part of being a member, part of supporting the channel is there's going to be different things available exclusively to members. And this is one of them. This is one of them. But at the same time, I'm going to leave the stream live to everybody. So you can watch, you can benefit, you can um, hear the book being read. If you've got the book, you can read along. Uh, the only thing you won't be able to do is comment after the reading or get involved in the discussion about the book. All right. All right. So, what so we need well, to discuss some and be careful. So what we don't want to do is get in trouble for copyright. Right. So we need to make sure that we don't do huge chunks of the book and that we're commenting on it as we go through so that it doesn't just end up being like an audio book. That's what, that's what I mean. So we, we, we have to stop and uh, respond anyway, isn't it? We have to do like a reaction, if you like, so it's fair use, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh. exactly. But I would recommend buying the book. I'm guessing Hamza's got his link for that in the description. Have I? <laughs> have you not? No, I don't think have you I not got the link for it? No. Well, if, if it's not there now, we'll get it put in there. Um, it's It's a good little book to have. Yeah, and the book we're reading. I would like to sort of try to motivate people to just get in the habit of buying books. So maybe you're not someone who ever buys books. Make this your first one, and uh, and sit down and read through it with us. And sometimes as well, like if you're doing a little book club, um, what we used to do in uni was we if say we had some specific reading we had to do for the next week, we'd read it on our own, building up to the week. And then we discuss it in the um, the lecture or in the seminar. And then we would... Um... Here's something I found on the web. Oh, shush. According yeah. to stateuniversity.com. <laughs> um, it's fine, bro. Yeah, I'll just pull that out. Um, so, yeah. So, and then we'd discuss it in the thingy. And then maybe we'd read it again afterwards together and, um, and talk about it again. So... It's good if you do a bit of reading. So like, for example, we're going to read through the prologue today. Um, we'll see what it says and we'll have a chat about it. And then next week, we'll try and read part one, the Judeo-Christian origins of modern science. So annoying, Ooh. that part. Yeah, it is. It is. But we can. It, there'll be a lot to talk about, won't there? And there's a number of subsections in here. Um, we don't have to go through all of them. But we can read a subsection, stop and chat about it. Um, because he makes the sub subsections pretty pretty small. But like for example, we read the prologue all together now, and then over the next week, if you've purchased the book, um, then you read chapter one over the next week on your own. And so then you're sort of prepared for the next week, and then you can see and we can discuss it. And if you want, you can jump on. And uh, have a little bit of a back and forth and make it engaging, inshallah. And so that people, like, like I said in our little debate that I smashed on yesterday, repetition is the master of learning. <laughs> repetition is the master of learning. So the uh, the more you repeat it or the more you read it, the more it's going to sink in. 
Um, and the more you'll understand the points that he's making, and inshallah, um, the more benefit it'll be, especially with dawah, etc. If you're engaging with people and this subject comes up um, with regards to quote unquote science uh, killing God, oh, but uh, yeah, if you got any other sort of comments you want to make before we get started, or was it him a little moon? We had a little moon. A little moon? Yeah. I have no idea what that is. Oh, bro. Some Japanese flag in Tesco. Like ice cream inside some kind of jelly thing. Uh, halal jelly? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Is it halal? Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, vegan. Okay, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. So I, I'm sharing the, the contents page. Um, if you can... Oh, yeah. Pull that up. So, this is going to be the flow of the book. Um, so, it's going to obviously today we're going to begin with the prologue and then part one, the rise and fall of theistic science. And that's broken into three sections. It talks about uh, the Judeo Christian origins of modern science. Um, and obviously, we're going to have something to say about that, about why <laughs> Muslims were not mentioned at all. Um, and then section two. Three metaphors in the making of a scientific world picture, and number three, the rise of scientific materialism and the eclipse of theistic science. And then he goes into section or part two, return of the god hypothesis. He talks about light from distant galaxies, the big bang theory, the curvature of space in the beginning of the universe, the Goldilocks universe, extreme fine tuning by design, the origin of life, and the DNA enigma the Cambrian and other information explosions. And then part three, inference of the best metaphysical explanation, how to assess a metaphysical hypothesis, the God hypothesis in the beginning of the universe, the God hypothesis in the design of the universe, the God hypothesis in the design of life. And then part four, conjectures and refutations. Uh, it begins with the information shell game, uh, one God or many universes, Stephen Hawkins and quantum cosmology, uh, the cosmological information problem, collapsing waves, and the Boltzmann brain, Boltzmann brains, and then at conclusion with part five and acts of God or God of the gaps, the Big Bang question, and why they matter. So that's the general flow. So he's going to basically deal with in part one, um, like how the, God was falling in and out of science, basically. Part two, he's just going to start going into a lot of the arguments that he thinks develop from science that can be used to prove that there is some sort of um, creator, you know, there's something that is actively making things um, behind the scenes that has certain attributes that would only really make sense to refer to um, a god with. Uh, part three, inferences to the best metaphysical explanations. Um, so yeah, obviously that's going to be a bit more complex, but we'll get into that. And then part four is going to be dealing with the, what he's, I guess, anticipating the atheist will say to him um, about the arguments that he's put forward in the book. And then I guess he's going to give a commentary on his responses to what he's assuming they will say. Uh, and then obviously he's going to conclude. So that, that is for the most that's part. The, that's the playlist. That'll take us about a year. Inshallah. Maybe, maybe we can get it done a bit quicker. Are we going to do this weekly? Yeah, inshallah. Unless at one point one of us is busy or both of us is busy. Yeah. I guess we can carry, we don't need both of us here. Um, well, I want, I want to have your feedback. I think that's invaluable, to be honest with you, bro. Yeah, well, I could always do a bit of a feedback video after. And then you could just upload that if you wanted to or something on yours. I, I think know. we do it on a Monday. I think, I think we're both usually free on a Monday, aren't we? Yeah, it should be. You're not playing any games. I don't have my daughter. I've only got her on weekends and yeah. sometimes on a Wednesday. And, and the one guarantee I'll give to people who do watch this is you'll chew atheists up with this information. I'm big sure. time. So th this, book, this book is designed to harness the latest claims coming from the scientific, atheistic, neo-atheistic atheistic worldview that apparently is supposed to help them in their beliefs or to dismiss the idea of a God or uh, the idea of a creator. 
Well, what this book does, it turns those latest discoveries on their heads and demonstrates that this just is further evidence for us that a creator exists. So when, when you read this book, you'll you, this is what you will conclude. Check. I'm not giving things away here, am I? This is the conclusion you'll be able to have. You'll be able to demonstrate. It's not, it's not Lord of the Rings, bro. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, uh, you'll, be able, you'll be able to demonstrate how um, the sciences of biology, the sciences of chemistry, the sciences of physics all point to an intelligent agency behind creation behind existence if you like and you'll demonstrate how absurd and how much blind faith you need to be to remain an atheist and to, to, to think the ideas of random mutation all of these things this book is going to do that for you now a bit of a disclaimer this geezer's a christian all right so you know stephen my he is a christian and you're going to hear that in flipping chapter one all right <laughs> It'd be good to see if um, after it as well. You might be able to just invite him on, see if we can get. Yeah, I think with him. I think Sabor's having a conversation with him actually. Yeah, yeah. well, if Sabor's having a conversation with him, try to get his um his contact his contact details. Yeah, yeah, through, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, you're um, the one in the contact with Sabor on all that, and your sapiens lighthouse flex going on. Are you talking about like you don't talk to Sabor for? <laughs> <laughs> You've known him for years. You've known him longer than I have. You've uh, got a video when with uh, Sabor with a baby face. Will be 10, 20 years. Yeah, honestly, I remember when Sabor was, you know, interviewing me when I first became Muslim. Yeah. And, um, I, I was treating him like he was just some random geezer who just like <laughs> just interviewing me. <laughs> Did you get me? It was like I didn't appreciate this uh, knowledge at that time. So hard. Oh, is this going to happen while we're reading? <laughs> like <you're just> doing... <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to switch the comments off when we're reading. I'm doing okay, that. Okay. Has this book won many awards? Um, I don't think so. I don't know. So it's got some good reviews. Oh, the uh, reviews are just next level. So I'll read some in the back. So this Go is on, by John C. Walton, PhD, DSC. I don't know what that is. Um, fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh and research professor of chemistry at the University of St. Andrews. He says, May's book is a masterpiece. It does irreparable damage to the atheist rhetoric and shows the God hypothesis offers the best explanation for our finely tuned information rich universe. Robert, uh, Dr. Robert Cater, formal, uh, former principal research physicist at the Princeton Plasma Physics, Physics Laboratory says, a comprehensive and lucid argument for theism as the best explanation for the scientific evidence, Stephen Mayer has a true gift for um, conveying complex concepts clearly. Dr. Michael Denton, former senior research fellow at biochemistry at the University of uh, Otago and author of Nature's Destiny, says an irrefutable case for God. Uh, the logic throughout is compelling and the book almost impossible to put down a masterpiece. Uh, Peter Robertson, Murdoch Distinguished Policy Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and former White House speechwriter, said more than 400 pages of straightforward, engrossing prose, close uh, close reasoning, intellectual history and cosmology, all the interest, all in the interest of asking the most important questions about existence itself, an astonishing achievement. Two more. Uh, do you want me to read them or can you not be good? I'll just tell you who, who wrote them. James M. Tor, PhD, TNT, and WF Chow. Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Nanoengineering at Rice University, and then Dr. Henry F. Schaefer III, uh, Gray, <laughs> Graham Perdue, Professor of Chemistry and Director of the Center for Compute Computational Quantum Chemistry at University of Georgia. Both had great things to say about see, it. Also. This is the thing you see, you know, these, those reviews you're just reading, you know, when people say to me, ah, Stephen Myers, a pseudoscientist. Oh, yeah, he, he's laughed at by his peers. And, that, yeah, and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These guys are all like flipping bioengineers and chemists and physicists and such. And they're all saying he's, he's banging it out. Yeah, he, he's <laughs> so what's going on? Listen to you, mate, with your Wikipedia? Or do we uh, do we listen to these guys? Do you know what I mean? It's like someone just put here uh, about it's a shame he believes in a 6,000-year-old Earth or something. I don't think he does. I think it's actually something about him that he doesn't actually believe that. Anyway, right. Without further ado, should we get on with the reading? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in the reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch off the chat. So, salam alaikum, everybody, and members will talk to you at the end. Salam alaikum. 
So now I believe the chat is switched off. Let's see. Oh, still there. Right there. <laughs> Unless that's like on a lag. Just make sure that did I did not say oh I didn't save it. Oh, for God's sake. Right, now the chat should be switched off. Someone comment? Someone say handsome Yusuf is. If you think handsome if you think Yusuf's handsome, put one in the comment section. If you don't think he is, the price if you don't think he is, remain silent. Where's that coming from? Oh, I <laughs> you sneaky git. <laughs> Just as you turn off the chat. <laughs> Everyone thinks he's a man of that. Without, without on, further ado, let's go with reading. All right, prologue. so we're going to read the prologue. Yeah. So this is what we're reading, just to remind you Return of the God Hypothesis, Stephen Meyer. Uh, your book looks so fresh, my mind looks battered. Um, Look at look, 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 Chris, but has it been on a, a library thing? Yeah, but all have right. you been putting uh, <coughs> all the bloody thingies in? Oh, you're not messing around, bro. Oh. That's what I want you to do when you see something you think is worth um, talking about. Then just let us know, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, let's go. Prologue. <laughs> Prologue. It was a public speaker's nightmare unfolding at the most inauspicious time. 18 minutes into my opening statement in a debate with physicist Lawrence Krauss, America's most prominent scientific atheist, I suddenly found I could no longer read my own PowerPoint slides. The brightly colored swirls or auras, for me a telltale sign of the onset of a debilitating migraine, had begun to fill my visual field as I looked out through the blaze of lights behind the video cameras in a packed auditorium at the University of Toronto. Intense light had often been a common migraine trigger for me, and it certainly was on that night in March 2016. As the aura spread, I began having trouble seeing not only the quotations and scientific diagrams on my slides, but Professor Krauss himself and the audience as well. Wow. Other neurological symptoms, numbness in my fingers and tongue, my voice echoing in my own head and a difficulty finding words, aphasia, followed predictably in rapid succession. I was able to make it through the remaining seven minutes of my presentation by speaking more slowly and deliberately than I usually do, and in some cases by using less technical words. But as I descended from the podium and I was taken to a dark room, I felt both disorientated and disappointed. I realized it would now be difficult for me to say much in the ensuing round table, following a third speaker, about the main question of the forum and the one I specifically came to discuss. So basically he was... He kind of blacked out on stage. Is that what he's saying here? Yeah, he's. I think he has some sort of condition, and um, it seems to kick in when he's under stress or something. Maybe. And, well, imagine though you got Lawrence Krauss in front of you, and you're about to go into it, and then <laughs> and then that's it. Subhanallah. Yeah, he's a plonker as well. He's um. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, which I doubt is anyone, because <laughs> it's like it's got so many views out now. Um, Amza Zoltz has had the debate with Lawrence Krauss, and uh, it didn't go too well for Lawrence, we'll say. And it, and I think William Lane Craig as well. Lawrence Krauss keeps getting into these debates and then just keeps getting smashed. Um, there was one with William Lane Craig where he was exposed for being very deceptive. So he had emails from another scientist about um, the results of something. And what he did is, you know, when you, you take the email and you, you do the brackets and go dot, dot, dot to skip a chunk out and then you miss a bit and go to the next bit to sort of paraphrase. Well, he, he did that. And so he'd give the email and he put some information in and then he put dot, dot, dot in brackets to say there was a bit missing. And then he went to the end. And the bit that he was missing, William Lane Craig managed to get hold of it. <laughs> and it turns out uh, that it was not in favor of what Lawrence Krauss was saying at all. And he was hiding that bit. And then when it was all read in context, and um, the guy as well even said that William Lane Craig had accurately represented the science or his idea of it, um, which just made Krauss look like an absolute tool. <laughs> Uh, let's the organizers of the forum had chosen the topic what's behind it all 
God, Science and the Universe. Professor Krauss, then of Arizona State University, and I were logical match to discuss this question from opposing points of view. Indeed, he and I had debated twice before, and I had often debated other scientific atheists during the preceding decade. Krauss, who spoke first, had a reputation not only as an accomplished physicist, but also as a bold and outspoken controversialist, one with a talent for explaining scientific ideas to a popular audiences. He is also well known for his prov provocative theses that quantum physics can explain how the universe came into being from nothing. But that evening, he didn't begin with a defense of that position. Instead, he began by declaring the topic of the forum unworthy of reflection and by characterizing me as unworthy of engagement. Indeed, he began the debate indulging in nearly 10 minutes of what his boisterous supporters clearly regarded as deliciously pers personal, invective, denouncing both me and my and by extension, the organizers of the forum. Yeah, he's, he's a bit of a uh, an idiot like that. And his book about um, the universe coming from nothing is is quite big, describing this nothing, which has a lot of qualities and attributes, apparently. And so technically, he's not nothing at all. He just wants to give yeah, it yeah, that word. Yeah. Sorry, go on. If you appear on stage with someone talking about these ideas, it gives the impression that the ideas are worth debating or that the person is worth debating, Professor Krauss declared. In this case, neither is true. When a rival in debate descends to ad hominem argument, I usually find myself surprised at his willingness to waste a lot of time. Audiences typically find insults masquerading as arguments unpersuasive. Moreover, in a debate, it usually takes a little to defang such tactics by beyond pointing them out. That night, however, Krauss's celebrity status had attracted hundreds of raucous supporters who laughed loudly at his punchlines, leaving me with the impression that an appeal to reason alone might not win the evening. As I began to speak, I pointed out that Krauss had provided little evidence to support his critique of my views, and still less in support of his own. Ordinarily, I might have also made light of his use of the ad hominem tactic, but on that night, humour escaped me as my neurological distress grew progressively more acute while standing before a large audience in the auditorium and an estimated 60,000 people watching online. I had accepted the challenge of the debate in part to explain my own position about what science can tell us about the existence of God. This is, needless to say, an ultimate question and a subject of urgent concern for many thoughtful people. It is an important topic, as even many atheists would agree and deserve a serious response. And although I sought to offer one that night, after the migraine set in, I knew my ability to do so would be significantly limited. Though, as it turned out, the cloud of my diminished condition would come with a silver lining. For the debate, I had planned first to explain my core argument for the intelligent design of life, and then, in the ensuing discussion, to address a question I am often asked. Who is the intelligent designer that you think is responsible for life? I also meant to address a closely related question, what does scientific evidence imply about the existence of God? Or, or as the organisers of the forum put it, what lies behind it all? Krauss answers that question with an emphatic nothing, or at least nothing but the laws of physics. Though he denounces philosophy as a vacuous enterprise, he publicly ad advocates a philosophy that scholars call scientific materialism an atheistic worldview affirmed by those who claim that science undermines belief in God. Pause there for a sec. So this is something quite common because Aaron Rad does a similar thing. And it's basically an appeal to sophistry. He's like, philosophy's crap apart from the philosophy I do. <laughs> so like everything I've said that's philosophical is perfectly reasonable. Um, and if anyone ever questions that, then they're engaging in crappy philosophy. Um, and it's really frustrating because, like it says there, he does hold philosophical positions, but it, it, he's, he's he's not clued up on the subjects enough. So he, he just tries to power it off by bad mouth in the whole enterprise, basically, um, that, which it says there. So though he denounces philosophy as a vacuous enterprise, let me highlight that. Though he denounces philosophy as a vacuous enterprise, he publicly advocates a philosophy that scholars call scientific materialism. Uh, an atheistic worldview affirmed by those who claim that science undermines belief in God. Um, but like, for example, with consciousness and things like that, if you try to reduce it to just materialism, there's a number of consequences for that. And it's not clear or obvious that that's what consciousness is either, uh, which alludes to this whole thing called the, the hard problem of consciousness, which we won't go into um, because it's a whole 
we did a stream on it. A whole nother book. Yeah, we did a um, a bit of a stream on it on Thought Adventure podcast. So if you haven't checked that out, go do so. You love these books, and, and don't forget the Lighthouse at Sapiens. Yeah, all right. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Like other worldviews, scientific materialism attempts to answer some basic questions about the ultimate reality. Questions about human nature, morality and ethics, the basis of human knowledge, and even what happens to human beings at death. Most fundamentally, a scientific materialism offers an answer to the question. What is the entity or the process from which everything else came? Scientific materialists have traditionally answered the question by affirming that matter, energy, and all the laws of physics are the entities from which everything else came, and that those entities have existed from eternity past as the uncreated foundation of all that exists. Matter, energy, and physical laws are therefore viewed by materialists as self-existent. Similarly, materialists hold that matter and energy organize themselves by various strictly naturalistic processes to produce all the complex forms of life we see today. This means scientific materialists also deny that a creator or designing intelligence played any role in the origin of the universe or life. Because materialists think that matter and energy are the foundational realities from which all else comes, they deny the existence of immaterial entities such as God, free will, the human soul, and even the human mind conceived as an entity in some way distinct from the physiological processes at work in the brain. Materialism is a venerable worldview with a long history going back to ancient Greece. It had been many prominent it had it had many prominent intellectual proponents, including Democriticus, so Democritus, Thomas Hobbes, Charles Darwin, Ernst Haeckel, Bertrand Russell, and Francis Crick. In recent years, powerful voices have popularized scientific materialism. Beginning about 2006, a group of scientists and philosophers known as the New Atheists ignited a worldwide publishing sensation. A series of best-selling books led by Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, argued that science properly understood undermines belief in God. Other books by Victor Stenger, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Stephen Hawking, and Krauss himself followed suit. Just, you know, the, that book, it was there was uh, atheist philosophers that said uh, that that book made them embarrassed to be atheist. <laughs> or oh, the God Delusion. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's, just, it's just another case of poor philosophy. In 2014, the Fox and National Geographic Television Networks aired a revamped version of a famous 1980 series with physicist Carl Sagan, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. The new series, Cosmos, A Space-Time Odyssey, hosted by astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, began by replaying audio of Sagan's memorable materialistic creed from the original series. The cosmos is all that it is, all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. The new atheists and other scientific popularizers had explained the basis of their skepticism about the existence of God with admirable clarity. According to Dawkins and others, the evidence of design in living organisms long provided the best reason to believe in the existence of God because it appealed to publicly accessible scientific evidence. But since Darwin Dawkins insists scientists have known that there is no evidence of actual design, only the illusion or appearance of design in life. According to Dawkins and many other neo-Darwinian biolog biologists, the evolutionary mechanism of mutation and natural selection has the power to mimic a designing intelligence without itself being designed or guided in any way. And since random mutation and natural selection, what Dawkins calls the blind watchmaker mechanism, can explain away all appearances of design in life, it follows that belief in a designing intelligence at work in the history of life is completely unnecessary. Now, this is something I, I find, you know, when you speak to atheists and they say, we don't have beliefs, we don't have beliefs, it, we, it's a lack of belief. And you're like, well, what are you talking about, mate? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, 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 you basically believe the alternate to what we believe as creationists. So you believe that, like Dawkins said here, that somehow random mutation and natural selection, natural selection can mimic, can mimic actual design. And it's like, yeah, well, so it's how do you prove looking that? like, yeah, it how looks like, that? yeah, so this is the thing, with, like, and uh, half of the time it's just because people haven't really studied, um, like philosophy in too much detail. Like, if, if you pick up any sort of book on critical thinking and stuff, um, even if you go to the Stanford Plato article on atheism, they give a good argument 
why atheism should be considered a proposition. And within philosophy as a field, atheism is a proposition. And a proposition can be true or false. It's not just a brain state. It's not just neutral. It's true or false. And you give arguments for or against it because it's the theist position, theism, which atheism is the negation of. Theism is a proposition that can be true or false. And if it's true, you give arguments for it. You give reasons for the truthfulness of that conclusion. And if you're atheist, then you'll, you hold a proposition that's the negation of that. That is, that there is no God. Now, some people call themselves atheists, even though they don't hold that position, which I think is wrong. And I'll get into that in a second. But it is a proposition. It's the negation of theism, which is to say that the statement there is a God, is false. And another way of saying that is that there is no God. Now, if you don't think that you can say that, or if you don't know that, then I would say that you're an agnostic, and that can take two forms. The first is hard agnosticism, which would be to say that we are not justified in saying that there is a God or that there isn't a God. That's a proposition that can be true or false. So that proposition is saying that all these arguments that atheists and theists put forward, none of them are convincing either way. They, they all fail to put forward the truthfulness of the claims or the propositions that they bring forward. You know, they don't reason them well enough. That's a proposition and which can be true or false because it is either true or false that atheists and theists have reasonable argumentations. And so you have a proposition which you need to demonstrate by giving negative arguments against the arguments both for them. But, 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 but basically, it's not even a negative argument. Basically, they're, they're accepting a proposition that, yeah, random mutation, um, harnessed by natural selection, can Yeah, they're giving positive design. arguments as well. Uh, and we, yeah. we believe it's not designed, it's just that random mutation and natural selection can mimic it. Yeah, and that really? is a proposition. Yeah, I know, yeah. course, no, because belief, belief means it, it basically means believe, accept, convince, trust, and you can only accept something if you've heard a proposition. So the proposition is this. Um, yeah, so what you see in nature is basically random mutation with natural selection, and there's no need for a creator, all right? And, that, and and if you accept that, then you believe that. So it makes me laugh how atheists try to deny the idea that they have beliefs when in fact they do and the, the irony is this they have blind faith really yeah i would say a lot of them do but they don't realize it you see they, they, you know what they remind me of they remind me of those christians who think the bible is a reliable source of information the what those christians who believe that the the, the gospels are written by eyewitnesses and all this kind of stuff and they built all the all of their theology upon it well atheists have the same problem because they, they they've got taken an assumed position and just built on top of it and when you when you look at the foundations, there's so much blind belief. Just you know, as someone's I don't know who it was who said it. I think was it Jake that uh, you need too much faith to be a, an atheist. He's <laughs> got that much faith, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, with the I, I, it's, I think someone else has said that. And Jake, I've said I've said that as well. To be honest with you, yeah. the faith you need to be an atheist is just too much. But just um, a little summary as well. So there is a softer version of atheist uh, of agnosticism. Uh, which is some sometimes just referred to as agnostic atheism, although I think using the terms like that, it's, it just confuses the, the discourse. But a softer version of agnosticism is just to say, I am not justified, rather than we. So it's not a claim about everybody. It's a claim about your own self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not really looked into it too much. And then the theist may be right, and the atheist may be right. It's just I've not looked into the arguments enough to say either way. That's I don't what know. I was, I would say. Yeah. So that would be like a, a sort of soft agnostic where the, the claim is only about your own epistemological limits, I guess, or your own limits in terms of what you know. Um, it's not saying anything about the facts of the matter and whether or not other people are justified. Whereas like someone who's a hard agnostic is, is someone who's saying you can't know either way. Like you, there's no way. And even the, the person, for example, that's a soft agnostic is still holding a proposition because maybe that it is true that they are not justified. And but maybe it's not. Like, for example, we hold things like the fitra. And you know, even Christians think believe in things like basic belief. That is, that you know, that, that believing in God is a neutral position. 
Mm. And if it is a neutral position, and if it is the starting point, then the person who says, I am not justified um, in believing one way or the other, um, there, there could possibly or potentially, I'm not saying there is, um, a potentially be an argument here against even them. And yeah. I'm saying that there's generally, if you if you hold a position, if you hold a term, then there's generally propositions associated to that, which can either be true or false. Unless you're completely ignorant of the discourse, you you just never heard of it. In which case, you you wouldn't really be holding a proposition at all because you've not even been involved in that discussion to be able to take um, a thingy either way. But even that, I guess, if what we're saying about basic beliefs or the fitra is true, um, then by default, everyone is involved in that discourse in one way or another. That makes sense. Right. Although Dawkins allows that it is possible that a de deity might exist, he insists there is absolutely no evidence for the existence of such a being, rendering belief in God effectively delusional. I think that's it's a strong no, claim. That, 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 that doesn't even make any sense. Delusion is believing something despite evidence against it. I mean, there's no evidence against it. Popular TV figures, Bill Nye, the science guy, has echoed this perspective in his book, Undeniable evolution and the science of creation he says perhaps there is intelligence in charge of the universe but darwin's theory shows no sign of it and has no need of it consequently as dawkins concluded in an earlier work darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist another new atheist philosopher daniel dennett gives an evolutionary account of the origin of religious belief in his book breaking the spell one that ultimately attributes belief in God to a cognitive impulse programmed into us by evolutionary process, rather than a rational or evidentially based system of belief. Thus, for those who know this, Darwinism functions as a universal acid, eating away at any basis for religious belief and traditional religious based morality. Other new atheists, including Lawrence Krauss, say that physics renders belief in God unnecessary. Krauss contends that the laws of quantum physics explain how the universe came into existence from literally nothing. Consequently, he argues it is completely unnecessary, even irrational, to invoke a creator to explain the origin of the universe. Stephen Hawking, formerly of the University of Cambridge and until his death in 2018, the world's best known scientist, made a similar argument in his book, The Grand Design, co-authored with Leonard Molodi, Molodino. He argues that because there is such a law as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists and why we exist. Thus, for Hawking, it is necessary to it is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. The late Victor Stenger made similar arguments in his poignantly titled book, God, the Failed Hypothesis. All this high profile science based scepticism about God has percolated into the popular consciousness. And that's what I'm talking about. They listen to Stephen Hawking, the most brilliant scientist. Well, if he's saying it, it must be true. Do you get me? Yeah. And, and well, this is this is where they become the high priests. Exactly. The so they, and they, they'll talk like because the majority of people that are on this flex are not clued up on all of the science to the degree that these gentlemen are that are propagating it. And that, you know, it includes like the majority of the people that I've got around me. Um, especially if you come from like a council estate where I am like, and people are just sort of like mocking God <laughs> and they maybe even reference these guys. A lot of people don't read books, but they'll follow these people. They yeah. don't, you know, they, they don't have a long attention span. So they can't really watch documentaries. They're too busy watching other crap on on tv but they'll you'll still hear them throw these names out yeah exactly bro that's and what i'm saying it, to you. They, they 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 do exactly what the christian does they have faith in these individuals yeah, completely completely so they, faith in these old men who wrote books so they have complete trust that these people know what they're on about and that they are onto something and that these conclusions are valid conclusions as, if it's, been in, as if it's been done in a laboratory <laughs> Yeah, and been yeah, proven yeah. and empirically tested and repeated. <laughs> yeah. So and that's that's the issue. And so this isn't to say that every atheist out there is completely unreasonable because there are some that are sincere and you maybe talk to them and I know you maybe disagree. Um and there's some agnostics that come across quite sincere when I've spoken to them. Um but the the issue is is just like 
how hard they go in their claims or, or to what degree they're willing to admit. Like the sincere atheists admit that they have faith in things that they have. Yeah. Yeah. I've, look, I've got no issue with uh, someone be, you know, I'm not having a dig at you, make Carlos, mate. So relax. But it's like, um, <laughs> no, but you can be, can be sincere, but sincerely wrong. And it's when they refuse to look at the evidence and, and they, they then start doing this idea of quoting Dawkins and Hawkins and all these kind of guys. Do you get me? Yeah. That's where I get then get riled. I'm thinking, you 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 mock religious people for saying they believe what's written in books, but yet you believe what's written in books. Do you get me? It's like a double standard. Anyhow, right. So all this high-profile science-based skepticism about God. Oh no, we did that, didn't we? Yeah, oh yeah, so it's it's percolated into the popular consciousness. Recent polling data indicate that in North America and Europe, the perceived message of science has played an outsized role in the loss of belief in God. In one poll, more than two thirds of self-described atheists and one third of self-described agnostics affirm that the findings of science make the existence of God less probable. According to the same survey, the two most influential scientific ideas that have affected people's loss of faith are unguided chemical evolution of the origin of life and unguided biological evolution of the development of life. According to these surveys, these two ideas have led more people to reject faith in God than has suffering from disease or death. Other polls have shown a dramatic rise in the group pollsters called the nuns. Was that you? Did you want to say something? I'm just going to search uh, Abdullah Andalusi because he shared a link recently um, on this subject about the idea that um, random mutations is true, is, is has become problematic, basically. Um, but he posts a hell of a lot. Oh, here it is. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you know, I found when people, you know, when this came out, this is recent, isn't it? This, uh, do you know what, you know, you know, what atheists started doing what they started, they started saying, no, it's not random. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> the mutation's not random now because of this, they, they just start, they just start denying they ever said it was random. Yeah, so a new study provides first evidence of non-random mutations in DNA. This goes against one of the key assumptions assumptions of the theory of evolution. Uh, genetic, genetic changes that crop up in organisms, DNA, may not be completely random, new re research suggests. Uh, that would upend one of the key assumptions of the theory of evolution. Researchers studying uh, the genetic mutations in a common roadside weed, Thale Cress, have discovered that the plant can shield the most essential genes in its DNA from the changes, while leaving other sections of its genome to build up more alterations. Uh, I was totally surprised by the non-random mutation we discovered. Lead author Gray Monroe, a plant scientist at the University of California, Davis, told Live Science. Ever since high school biology, I have been told that mutations are random. So this is an example of dogma exactly it's, so they've been told that they are random ah not maybe not possibly not kind of not a little bit not we're not 100 percent sure no they are random that's what's being taught and th and this is the whole thing that we keep talking about about scientific epistemology and this is what we're talking about here in this it's the, about the philosophy of science and it's when you see the debates that Aaron Ra had with for example Sabor Ahmed when you start making mention of the philosophy of science they don't like it and uh, Krauss just poo poos all over the subject completely and he's like Ugh. philosophers uh, you know crap and the reason is is because it they have to deal with their foundation they have to deal with that and if anyone watched I'm going to plug Thought Adventure Podcast, uh, the discussion on there with Aaron Rye as well. So he just says a lot of things, and it's like, all right, well, let's get understand what you mean. Like, what where's what base are you coming from? So we can figure out how you're justified and then making these claims. And they get rattled by it. You made him look like a spoiled little brat. 
And the, the the reason is is because they 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 just they and it sort of talks about in here. Um, funnily enough, we were just talking about it uh, on Sunday because I, I do a book club for this one too on my Discord. How and you um, that, man? what? I know I'm plugging. I'll plug everything, mate. Plug plug plug. <laughs> um, and it, it, basically, in the first few chapters of this, he's talking about how, um, like th this. Science has a paradigm, and it sort of has to have its own way of viewing the world, and so it takes on certain assumptions. And when you're going in through the process of learning, and you you put into college, and then you know you do a bachelor's and things like that, you're, you're taught things as almost like a dogma. Basically, it's just that you know this is what our forefathers have said. And this is the way when we operate with through this lens, things work. We get results. Things are happening. And so long as you operate like this, it's good. And it's called normal science, where it's not revolutionary. It's, it's not trying to undermine its own foundation. And when anomalies pop up, they generally get ignored. And he even says that sometimes the anomalies will be act. You know, anyone that comes against the the paradigm that's in play. Um, can even be actively attacked by the community because it undermines what they're trying to do. And for the most part, normal science, it isn't trying to undermine itself. It's just trying to get greater precision with the things that it's doing. And then too many anomalies crop up to the point where they have to come up with a new story, a new narrative through which science can then progress. And he says that science needs this. You, you can't operate with science if you don't have a a paradigm and there's they have certain commitments and there's four of them that you mentioned so conceptual theoretical instrumental and methodological but these can vary and they do and there's a whole discussion about what the scientific method is and there's no agreement on what that is exactly either so you know there is dogma there is dogma. There is right. faith in certain principles. There's faith in a certain methodology. And people are falling for it. And like you said, people that people are believing these things without understanding what they're supposed to be believing and believing the idea that it's all proven. And and this is the thing as well. This isn't to poo-poo all over it either. It's fine. This is just what science is. And it it is a, a great field of study. And it does provide amazing things. And pointing this out doesn't make it crap. It's just acknowledging what it is. You've got to understand your tool in order to be able to use it properly. And if you don't have an understanding of the foundation of the whole process, then you get into conundrums like you do with these plunkers that we're reading about. Um, bloody Dawkins and Krauss and the like. Uh, shall, shall I continue? Yeah, go ahead. All right. That's very nicely done, though. Yeah, Other sorry. polls have shown a dramatic rise in the group posters called the nuns, religiously unaffiliated, agnostic or atheistic respondents among college and post-college young people in the 18 to 33 age range. The rapid growth of this group occurred precisely during the recent decade in which the new atheists have gained prominence. Indeed, there are many indications from personal interviews, public opinion polls and website testimonials that college students in particular have been deeply influenced by the message of the new atheists. Many of these students now cite arguments similar to those made by Dawkins, Krauss, Dennett and Hitchens as their main reasons for rejecting faith in God. These developments have a particular poignancy and interest for me for two reasons both of which helped to explain why I agreed to debate Krauss in 2016 and why I've chosen to write this book. First, I have long been interested in the question of biological origins. Over the last decade, I have written two books arguing that living, arguing that living systems exhibit evidence of intelligent design, whereas Richard Dawkins contends that living systems merely give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. I have argued that certain features of living systems in particular the digitally encoded information present in DNA and the complex circuitry and information processing systems that work in living cells are best explained by the activity of an actual designing intelligence. Just as in the inscriptions of the Rosetta Stone point to the activity of an ancient scribe and the software in a computer program points to a programmer, I've argued that the digital code discovered within the DNA molecule suggests the activity of a designing mind in the origin of life. Nevertheless, in making my case for intelligent design, I have been careful not to claim more than the biological evidence alone can justify. 
In my previous books, I did not attempt to identify the designing intelligence responsible for the origin of the information present in living organisms or to prove the existence of God. After all, though I don't hold this view, it is at least logically possible that a pre-existing intelligent agent somewhere else within the cosmos, i.e. not God, might have designed life and seeded it here on Earth. As scientists who advocate a view known as panspermia have suggested, instead, I have simply... Uh, I mean, we hear this a lot as well, isn't it? Aliens put us here. Yeah, so it's still, like, basically what they're saying is that consciousness is responsible for consciousness. Like, it, And it, there's, there's pretty funny videos as well where Neil deGrasse Ty Tyson's talking to someone and, uh, and the guy starts saying, what we're finding when we look into the very fabric of the universe is we find code we find code and it like it always has this inference or this implication that there's something alive coding things yeah programmer yeah yeah and, and it's just it's hilarious and what what's even it's it's annoying and just to sort of mention what he was talking about in that paragraph before um where he was mentioning that a lot of people leave so if you think about how the education system is transformed yeah the education system back in the day, for example, in Europe, religion or religious um, education would have focused on Christianity and Christianity would have got like an in-depth overview that would have gone in hard on the theology. Yeah? They didn't have like what it is now, religious studies, where you get one hour a day with usually it's the most awkward teacher in the school. Without, like, ev ev just whoever's commenting now, let us know. What was your religious studies teacher like in school? Did How many of you, I, I really want to know this. Can we get a poll or something? Let's make a poll. Uh, how many of you had a weird religious studies teacher that was awkward? And how often was it that these classes just didn't, you didn't learn anything? Because everyone was, like, in mine, I went to a, a secular high school and our teacher um, we, 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 she was abused. Oh, like we called her, we changed the name and everyone said, like, I don't even want to really tell you. It's, it's, it's bad. Like the way we, we just, we abused her. We, we took the mick out of yeah, her. Yeah. We broke her door. We used to set the fire extinguishers off. We'd mess about. She used to be the librarian as well. And we'd be, we'd abuse the library. And, but you were taught every religion in one class. And what it does is it just, flattens it and they're all taught as if they're all the same you know this you know, the general liberal approach to these things yeah and yeah it, this is what they believe this is what they believe and it, all it does is the 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 whole process of that particular field of study in that one hour a week that you got it just sort of flattened all religions and made them all as good as each other and then the science you would get a full class just for biology a full class just for um, physics, a full class just for chemistry and a full class for mathematics and and you went in deep in all of them and usually you would have cool teachers it, you didn't always, we had one that was like welcome to the physics class you're through to Mr. Douche we're going <laughs> to talk about stuff today and he got bullied as well but like there was sometimes there, there were cool teachers that could make it interesting and they would do co cool experiments which yeah, were yeah. interesting like oh look foam everywhere watch this it goes pop this goes bang this whistles this changes color this fizzes like there's things going on at least so you could get engaged <laughs> in it a little bit whereas the tell, tell, class... I tell you my experience Go. we had an re teacher we called a wiggy she had, she had, she had like, she's like wear like a little wig this big yeah. wig right and her nickname was wiggy yeah and like you said we used to just abuse the class if you had homework to do from another for next lesson you do it in that do class it in that or whatever our physics teacher, Dr. Harrington, used to kidney punch us. Proper, kid, proper kidney punch, man. Proper. And, and, and I left school. I left school that science is serious and religion's a joke. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. And, and, then, and then that bleeds into um, the higher education as well, because we, we live in a highly technological world where if you go in to study the sciences, you can get good jobs and earn a lot of money. So there's a lot of motivation to go into that. And because, like, in the West in particular, you've got this very skewed religious studies system in place that just makes people lean away from it. Like, the secular schooling is just not concerned with 
teaching people like a proper legitimate overview of religious discourse at all. Yeah, and, you know, and, and well. it spreads it too thin. It spreads it too thin. You know, maybe as well though. In the in the in the you know, like in the press in the media. Yeah, and you you'd get like a newspaper article that say scientists discover our ancient ancestor was some kind of worm. This that the other, and then and the next day, Myra Hindley. You know, you, you know her. Myra Hindley, you know the, the the woman who killed and tortured those kids, no, with Ian Brady. Anyway, she was a, she was a child killer, uh, a mole I think molester and killer. Anyway, she died. Myra Hindley, burn in hell. Hey, what? <laughs> How many you're telling us we we evolved from these worms and this that the other as if some naturalistic? Now now you're talking about hell. So the confusion is out there as well. Do you get me? Yeah, the the um, cognitive dissonance in the. The, the structure of the whole the education. Fitra, the fitra is there, you know that. The fitra is there. There must be justice. There must, she, she can't get away with doing what she did. You know what I mean? They, they yeah. can't help but believe there's going to be something afterwards. But it, I, I think just to sort of summarise now so we can get back on with reading, um, the whole point is is that the education system is, it's like the Hadith says, everyone is born upon the fitra uh, until their people take them away from it. And if you've got an education system that, that treats religion like that and then treats everything else with so much more regard and then on top of that you have popular media um which you know in the movies and things like that like did you ever watch dogma oh what just, a movie. yeah but it was, it's a comedy but it was like you, you just have a lot of things sort of taking the mick out of um like religious sentiments and making jokes out of it and like it's and there's other things obviously the comedians that were really funny a lot of them were atheists you have, uh, you know, the, the popularization of people like Ricky Gervais, etc., who sort of they go on these anti-religious. After Afterli Afterlife is real, real. Uh, it's, it's nihilism, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. pure nihilism, and and he, he goes after any type of supernatural thing yeah. in in that program. He just nails it all down. But he, he likes to pat himself on the back as well, constantly like, "Oh, you're so you're so clever, you're so clever," and it, like towards his own character, which is basically just the manifestation of him. R r reminds me of Plato, right? Should we continue? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, really. <laughs> no, sorry. Do you, do you want to continue anything else, or are you all right with that? No, yeah, no. Stop reading. All, all right. So, um, so he said. He, so, uh, okay. No, really? We were at the part on page six where it said, might have designed a life and seed it here on earth, a scientist who advocate a view known as panspermia have suggested. Instead, I have simply argued that the information present in DNA suggests the prior creative activity of an intelligent agent of some kind, as opposed to an exclusively blind or undirected natural process such as random mutation and natural selection. Despite this limited claim, my explanation for the appearance of design still places me at odds with the new atheists. Even so, though they have adopted diametrically opposed explanations for the appearance of design, we have focused our explanatory efforts on the exact same phenomena of interest. And that leads to the second and perhaps more important reason for my interest in what I call the God hypothesis. The new atheists pose the question of what the evidence from the natural world as a whole shows about the existence or non-existence of God. My readers evidently share an interest in that question. Many upon encountering my argument for the intelligent design of life have written asking a series of questions of roughly the following form. If there is scientific evidence of the activity of a designing intelligence, then what kind of a designing mind are we talking about? An intelligent agent within the cosmos or beyond? An imminent or transcendent intelligence? A space alien or God? Since my previous two books led inevitably to such questions, it has increasingly seemed a natural next step for me to explore what science can tell us about them and about the possible existence of God. And this is the thing you see when you speak to atheists, you, you, you're not saying um, this proves God exists. It's just the fact that, wait a minute, how do you explain this? Your explanation isn't good enough. And, and they, we're, we're just providing another hypothesis to the explanation. Yeah. And you're dismissing us. Why? And, and then, I think this is important. Like he said here, he's not trying to demonstrate God did it, but he's trying to demonstrate this science that an intelligent agency did do it. Now let's try to understand what that intelligent agency could be. Yeah, so at least begin the conversation and not just talk about it as if it's the underlying yeah, just, principle just of all of it. Yeah. It's just blind and dead. Now, the reason I guess they, they want to sort of poo-poo all over that is because it just begs the question, if you're going to say that aliens 
had to create us and that that sort of explains why we are here because the, the evidence seems to suggest it then the issue with that is all them what about them aliens are they the product of random mutations or are they themselves the product of something and it always ends up going back to the philosophy because then you've got to start to discuss well can you just have this infinite regress of aliens made us and then other like meta aliens made those aliens and then meta meta aliens made those. like is that uh more reasonable than suggesting one thing which is necessary and which is independent that everything is dependent upon and is itself eternal and is a creative force basically a god and if you use Occam's razor I was about to say that. yeah it's it's much less complex it's much like you don't need to unnecessarily expand all of these causal things into this infinite regress of alien bloody what's it called inception we just need our call. uncreated alien that's always existed yeah basically it's just that and there's another video um where neil degrasse tyson he's like he's talking about if he ever witnessed something supernatural and he had someone close to him who did their, their father passed away and then they witnessed his spirit or something and he trusts her and he doesn't think she was crazy or anything but he was he was like if that ever happened to me first thing i would do was i'd go get my my thermometers and that i'd start asking them you know what temperature it is there it's like bull crap like as if you like what's you've got this moment like this last moment with someone you love dearly who's just passed away and you're telling me you're going to go get your thermometer what's to say that it's going to be there long enough for you to like do experiments on and that it's not just going to evaporate and things like that and then in another one he starts he, he's talking about four dimensional beings and he's talking about how you know that there could be creatures that could see you but you can't see them because they they live on a fourth dimension and and then it's like oh, when he's saying things like that, all I can think is about the description of the jinn. Yeah, they, they they they're in a place where they can see you, but you can't see them. And and then the, the Carl Sagan, he has this whole thing on the fourth dimension, and he's talking about this four dimensional being is hovering above the human and or the, talking to them. And um, well, he's he's using Flatland as an example, and you've got this three dimensional creature above a flat two dimensional creature, and when he's talking to him. It sounds like it's coming from inside his head. And it's like, bro, that's gin. <laughs> like, it, it, it just, there's so much overlap. And, it, and they'll talk about all these other things, about aliens, about four-dimensional creatures, and this, that, and the other, and be like, yeah, it's perfectly possible. And then in the next breath, mock the, the ancients for believing in things like angels and demons. And it's like, <laughs> are you serious? You just want, you, you're talking about, Almost the same thing. You you just just right, yeah, exactly. It you just want to give exactly. it a name. name. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so this. So, so yeah, we've got this. So this section, slow to speak, and then there's an unexpected discovery, and then that ends the prologue, and we'll finish yeah, that yeah. one. So. so the debate in Toronto and its aftermath sealed my decision to address this subject in a book-length treatment. In the debate, I was able to explain my base case for intelligent design in biology. Nevertheless. My migraine adult state made it difficult for me to say much about the larger question of what science could tell us about God, as I'd hoped to do in the ensuing discussion. Nevertheless, one advantage of not being able to speak well or only be able to speak slowly and deliberately is that it forces you to say the most important things and do so succinctly. I have a friend with Tourette syndrome who stutters and sometimes finds it difficult to work his way into fast moving conversations. As a result, he often blurts out incredibly pithy insights that distill the essence of a topic in a few words, sometimes to the amazement of friends. Something similar happened for me that night. During the last five or ten minutes of the debate, as my symptoms started to dissipate, but only just, the moderator asked us to summarise our perspective on what science could tell us about what lies behind it all. I find myself briefly describing three key scientific discoveries that I thought jointly supported theistic belief, what I call the return of the God hypothesis. One, evidence from cosmology suggesting that the material universe had a beginning. Two, evidence from physics showing that from the beginning, the universe had been finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. And three, Evidence from biology establishing that since the beginning, large amounts of new functional genetic information have been arisen in our biosphere to make new forms of life possible, implying, as I had argued before, the activity of a designing intelligence. 
After the debate, I received sympathetic mail from many people who felt badly about me having to battle a migraine at such a public event. But many who wrote also told me that the one thing they remembered about the substance of the debate was my closing statement and that the succinct description of the three scientific discoveries that together point not just to a designer, but to an intelligence which attributes that religious theists have long ascribed to God. I realized later that I had, perhaps without plan to do so, distilled in a few words a way of structuring a persuasive and accessible science-based argument for the God hypothesis. Perhaps I thought it was time to develop this case. An unexpected discovery. Another unexpected benefit of participating in the debate occurred completely out of the view of the audience. As I prepared for the night in the two weeks leading up to it, I studied Krause's proposed explanation for the origin of the universe. I also pored over a key technical paper and book written by Russian physicist Alexander Vilenkin, whose ideas Krauss had popularized in his book A Universe from Nothing. I was stunned by what I found. Krauss used the word of Valenkin in an effect to refute what is called the cosmological or first cause argument for the existence of God, an argument that posits God as the cause of the beginning of the material universe. As I reflected on what Valenkin wrote, however, I concluded that Krauss completely missed the real import of Valenkin's work, which arguably implied the need for a pre-existing mind. See chapter 17, 19, more detail. Over the preceding years, I had noticed a similar pattern in the writings of other scientific materialists as they responded to arguments for intelligent design in both physics and biology. As I show in later chapters of this book, the allegedly strongest counter arguments against the theory of intelligent design often inadvertently seem to strengthen rather than weaken the case for design. For example, Attempts to explain the origin of what's called fine-tuning of the universe by invoking a multiverse inevitably required invoking prior unexplained fine-tuning. Attempts to explain the origin of the information necessary to produce new forms of life invariably either required prior unexplained information or, un involved, sorry, or involved simulations that required the intelligent guidance as a programmer, biochemist or engineer as a condition for their success. Thus, common responses to the argument for intelligent design in physics and biology typically beg the question as the origin of the prior indicators of design and consequently strengthen those arguments. I now discovered that a similar problem amended claims to have I now discovered that a similar problem attended claims to have explained the origin of the universe from nothing. Properly interpreted, the physics used this way only seem to reinforce the conclusion of the cosmological argument. So my difficult evening in Toronto had another unexpected benefit. Going into it, I knew the typical and strongest counter arguments to each of the three interrelated arguments that I'd long wanted to make in support of the God hypothesis. I already knew that two of those counter arguments inadvertently reinforced my case. Now I came to suspect from my debate preparation and my interaction with Krauss that the main counter arguments to the third line of evidence. Are you, are you stopping me or are you just touching your mic? Just muting my mic. Well, it looks like you're going, can I speak? Can I speak? Now I came to suspect from my debate preparation and my interactions with Krauss that the main counter argument to the third line of evidence, I intended to marshal evidence from cosmology, did the same thing. I realized it was time to write this book. That was nice. Should we switch on the chat now? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so let's let's see how this rolls. I don't know how this is going to roll now. So it might be I'm good gonna... to try and send him the link to this as well and just see if he's all right with us doing it or that he's not got no objections. You think so, yeah? Yeah, just to be safe. Um, I think reading the prologue shouldn't be a problem, especially the way we've done it. Um, but, I, like, I don't know, you just want to be safe. Um, oh, I'll speak to support see if he's got... Um... But usually it's not him you have to speak to, it's the publishers, isn't it? Um, maybe. Because they're in it for the doll. Who's the publisher? Right, are the people back in the room? They should be back in the room now. Um, Who? Oh. I I they probably no one's ever drinking tea and eating. Can somebody comment to see if the chat's back? Yeah, the no, they have, they have, they have. Um, members only mode is on. Yeah, we back. Well read. I'm not seeing anything. Uh, it's because it's not on. Streamyard, but it's on. Oh, it's not Streamyard yet. Right, let it's me just refresh YouTube. my Streamyard. I might disappear. No problem. Right, it's uh, it's now the use of Ponder Show. Everyone. Yeah, well, back, well, in the, back in the room. Oh, back in the room. I didn't last long. Is it? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all green. It's all green. Who's the publisher? Harper One. Yeah, maybe you might need to get in touch with them. Sh should I put the link in the chat? Something. If you put the link in the chat, it's going to make the making the thingy members only a bit redundant. If I put the link in the chat, that would mean that non-members can see the link in the chat. You mean? Yeah. Ah, all right. So how do you do that then? So you can't bring people on then? Well, you can, but it's just it's not going to be only the members. <laughs> it's up to you. Your boss, man. I don't mind having me. All right. Any what members got any well? questions? Any, any anyone got anything to say? Any questions you want to ask? Whilst we've got Yusuf in the room. That was beautifully done, bro. That was nice. That was a prologue. Really done nicely, man. We've got a lot of information out there. You, yeah, you and want... it's good that we we, like, we got it. I know for those watching, it might be frustrating if you're expecting it to be just sort of read. Um, but we can't do that. We can't just read it. It can't be um, a bloody audio book. We, we've got to give commentary on it as we're reading through it um, so that we're engaging with it, quote unquote, creatively. I don't know what you want to refer to it as. Um, because it's supposed to be unique content and you can't just read someone's book and not engage with it at all. Um, because then it, it'd be copyright infringement. Okay. So if you're only wanting to hear the audio book, go on audiobooks.com. I don't know, I don't know why my, my um chat is not up, updating. Uh oh, I've got cool. I've got the chat here. I've got it on YouTube. Want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So pull it up on if you want. Just share my screen, and you can see the chat there. Um, no, but I, can, I, I want to highlight chat, isn't it? Uh, well, I, yeah, I can like highlight. Well, that's too small. No, what I mean is, no, I like, can make it bigger. I can make it bigger. No, I want to do that. Yeah, no. Oh, it's it's, it's updating now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just how did that happen? I don't know. Maybe it's because you sh shared. Oh, okay. okay. Marshall. Okay, so what do you guys think of that? Did you like the format? Um, have you got any questions? Yeah, yeah there's one there. A, that's yeah. a question. So that's just not engaging with the arguments. I would say, that, well, that you're not. What's this? I would. Say, I'd just return it to them and say you're doing pseudo philosophy. You're not like there's a, like basically he's giving arguments. He's not even given any arguments yet because this is just the bloody yeah. Color. But when we get into it, he's going to give arguments and he's going to have conclusions with reasons that lead to the conclusions. And what you'd need to do is you'd need to engage with what he's presenting and showing why it it's invalid or why it's not sound, why his premises. That, that's what I say. That's honestly, when anyone says this to me, I say, well, tell me something he said that you believe is pseudoscience. It's a non-argument. One sec. This is the best meme ever. For whenever anyone does this, um... Gabriel's asking, "How much did we read? We read the prologue." <laughs> yeah, we only read the prologue. Uh, we've got to double check that everything's going to be fine, right? Here we go. It's the funniest. This. So, if anyone ever says to you, uh, "Oh, this is just pseudoscience," share this with them. Uh... Have you got it on? Yeah. Not an argument. <laughs> <laughs> just if anyone says that to you, just give them that. Just send them that meme. Um, does philosophy of science allow the negation of God in any way? No. Yeah. Well, it, people make arguments for it. Um, although the philosophy of science is the philosophy of science is not the philosophy of religion. So, uh, no, I don't think it would really deal. Maybe it would deal with the question of to what degree science can talk about religious matters. But insofar as science is the study of the natural world, then it would seem that that would instantly negate it from its realm of study. Um, or not necessarily. I guess there's a discussion to be had about it. Because obviously this is what this book is, isn't it? It's if science can give evidence for or not um it's all part of that interesting thing because for me personally um i prefer the philosophy side of things so i would rather use philosophy i think the conversation of whether or not science 
can infer a creator is an interesting one, although I don't think it's necessary. Um, and whether if the answer is yes or no to that question, it doesn't matter um, as far as I can say, because it, it's the whole issue with uh, science doesn't give absolutes. It gives inferences to the best explanation based on the available evidence. So maybe there's certain arguments that they, they might work now, but then science has a habit of flip-flopping. If you think like how they've moved from thinking the universe is finite to infinite to finite and then to infinite again, there's at least one time with these two where they've held a scientific position based on the available evidence and that position has been false. Yeah. As because you're going to, as you will discover, as you will discover, you know, the steady state theory and all that and how they just slowly collapsed when new information came along that the, the long held positions had to collapse. Um, so I am Harold. Yes. Um, there's, there's chapters titled The Light from Distant Galaxies, The Big Bang Theory, The Curvature of Space in the Beginning of the Universe, The Goldilocks Universe, Extreme Fine Tuning, The Origin of Life, and The DNA Enigma. Sorry. So, yeah, so there's plenty to do with cosmology, just to answer that question. Um, yeah, you have covered, some said you covered a lot of topics, which is really good, man. What did they say? Well, since it's the use of Ponder show, alhamdulillah. <laughs> when you got off, that's what I said. I was like, welcome to the <laughs> To be honest with you, I love learning from you, bro. And alhamdulillah. Um, uh, any more questions? I feel really bad for those who are not members or watching and <laughs> probably have questions. So someone said that atheists usually dismiss anything said by atheists as pseudoscience. What actually is pseudoscience? So pseudoscience is just uh, stuff that's not really utilizing like for example uh flat earth as it sort of currently understood would be somewhat well not it is it's pseudo scientific um that kind of thing basically where they're sort of they're making inferences to things with minimal information when there's much more evidence to something else etc and uh this might get We'll pull up a definition. So is this argument to intelligence? A collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on scientific method. Uh, so is this argument of intelligent design a deductive argument? Um, oh, I've not seen it yet. So I'm not 100%. Yeah, no spoilers. Um... It's probably going to be inductive, I would say. Um, What's the difference between deductive argument and an inductive argument? Uh, so a deductive argument is where the conclusion necessarily follows. So an example would be um, Socrates, uh, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is a mortal. The two premises necessarily lead to the conclusion. So all, all A's are B's. Socrates is an A, therefore Socrates is a B. So if it's necessarily the case that all A's are B's, if someone is an A, then they are a B. Uh, that would be a deductive argument. It's not about probability, it is absolute, it is the case. Uh, an inductive argument is um, one that is based on probability. So you might say, you know, if most men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then it's most likely that he is um, mortal. So there, it's the, the conclusion is probably, he's probably a, a man. Uh, sorry, he's probably mortal. Um, or like, for example, uh, if m most swans are white. So if you see a swan, it's probably white. Um you know, you're dealing with anything basically is inductively valid if it's over 0 0.5. If it's more likely to be the case that it's true, then it can be considered inductively um, convincing. Uh, so an argument that requires probability that the odds against it are more zeros in that than particles that exist in the universe. What kind of argument would that be? Um, well, they would be making an argument from induction if it's based on probability. 
Okay, um, and what, so what if somebody sides with an absurd probability over? So, that, yeah. So, if for example, if if the, the probability is below zero point five, then it's not considered inductively convincing. So the question is, is you know, <laughs> is I mean, have it, you seen the have real... you seen the probability of? I mean, we're going to come to it. I've seen the probability of a cell randomly mutating to something beneficial. Yeah, that's why they have to posit infinite universes because then that would put the pod, the probability over zero point five. Um, because what they're saying is is that there's infinite amounts of universes, and if there is, then it it is possible. It's very likely, given that there are no, infinite. But, but how, how how would that play a part? So, for example, you have a cell in this Earth. And for it to create new um, proteins, it has to mutate. Yeah. Yeah. But the probability of that mutation being something beneficial it way outweighs it being something positive. Yeah. But they're assuming that it did happen. Yeah. So they, well, they, they, well, this is where it always ends up having to go back to the philosophy again, because they're going to be positing um the, there's the the possibility of an actual infinite rather than just a potential infinite like there has to be an infinite number of universes in order for that to be the case but the question is is can there be um and then even then we've still got issues with regards to other things like how did, did these things come to exist in the first place even if there is so yeah it's i don't know if you're following that Oh, no, 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 I do. I do. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work out how, for example, for those atheists who don't believe in an infinite number of universes, yeah, they just believe in the universe, the singularity became what it came. And then this cell, you know, the, the, from the magic custard, we get this cell, and then this cell has to mutate, and it just happened to mutate to something beneficial. The probability of that happening is absurd. It's really low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not really low. It's absurd. Apparently, I looked at the. We're going to read it anyway. But the, the, there's when it says, you know, to the power of those zeros. There's more particles in the universe. Sorry, there's more zeros than there are particles in the universe for oh, the so probability. So it's like, you know, again, we'll hear the example. So I'm doing spoilers now. Look at this. What a hypocrite I am when he talks about how the work, the works of Shakespeare. I'm devoted one. Yeah. <laughs> the work, the works of Shakespeare is true. I'm the works too, of obviously. Shakespeare could be the work of a man, yeah, or possibly the work of a billion monkeys on a billion typewriters typing for a billion years. And the probability of it being the monkeys is ridiculous, but it's possible yeah. in their worldview. And when it comes to what we're talking about, the random mutation. They're choosing the monkeys. Unbelievable. But yeah. we'll get to that. We'll get to that. What's this? What kind of comment is this? Damn, I need to start losing weight. <laughs> Where did that come from? Maybe they meant it as a text message to someone and they send it to Oh, they're guy. looking at me and thinking, God, Hamza's looking a bit fat. I'm looking in the mirror. Oh, so am I. Is that what it is? Well, maybe it's they're looking right? at you and thinking, Hamza's looking lean. No, I uh, <laughs> always oh, intermittent fasting must be working. Yeah, um, and then they're sort of comparing it to themselves. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing about this mutation business, it has to happen in three point five billion years, again and again and again and again and again. Where did the first cell come from? How was it formed? Come on, we're Muslims, man. Is this a question for the atheists? They'll tell you it came from the magic custard, which came from the stars. Well, came... we could, there could, there is a case as well. Like, for example, you could make the case of Adamic exceptionalism, which is just to say that Adam alayhi salam was a unique creation and that he was made independently. And you could say that, you know, that well, I don't think that's the question, bro. I, I don't think that's the question. I don't know. That's it's the just question. Where we the ask... from. We're talking about possible answers. So if no, you're asking this... an atheist, they could no, say that. Like we're asking the atheist the question. All oh, right. Well, I don't know. There's no atheist here. No, no, no. But what? That's what. That's what I think. That's what the brother's saying is that um, this is what we should be asking atheists. You know, before we get to the mutation of that. Thing that this is one of the first things that was asked me when I was atheist when I was talking yeah. to Muslims for the first time. 
Where did the first? Um, because they Kevin were saying Nash. that, and I kept Kevin saying Nash. evolution. And then yeah, it always, it always goes back to the they magic. hate it when I call it the magic custard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny. <laughs> they hate it. But that's what it is, though. That's what it is, though. Where, where did you word get word the though. magic custard thing from? Uh, I just know because you know they kept talking about this primordial soup, this idea of this thing, and then it's, it's like magic. So um because they keep mocking us, isn't it? Oh, Sky Daddy and all this kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I like to reverse it on them. Oh, you believe in the magic custard, do you? <laughs> you, you believe in the, the floor daddy, the goo, the floor goo dad. <laughs> Uh, oh, he's answered. He said, uh, literally random thought. I've been eating way too many pies the last couple of years. Uh, intermittent fasting. Uh, yeah, right. You online. Listen, I have to, I've said this many, many times, Gabriel, and I know you're a, you're an actual stalker. So you should know this, that since I've been trying to open my <laughs> bloody shop, it's gone out the window, mate. Eating when I can. <laughs> See, I can read between the lines, mate. You're familiar with your crowd, though, aren't you? Yeah, no, but I could see the question because you're not going to ask a Muslim where did the first elk from? Come here, who was it? Allah. There you go. Next question. You know what I mean? Yusuf, what's your opinion on quantum particles in nothing? For instance, quantum particles can appear in a vacuum void. However, this doesn't make nothing, nothing anymore. Uh, Yusuf, what's your opinion in nothing? So th this is the thing. It's not nothing. So I wrote an article. <laughs> on a debate that was happening well it wasn't really a debate because i don't think galileo even knew it was no, back in a minute yeah you answer the question i'm coming yeah. out yeah so there was a discussion between um well they it wasn't even a discussion they can't was responding you've let you've not unmuted yourself you've not unmuted yourself i mean you've not muted yourself. hamza you need to mute Right, I'll just talk so that you, maybe I can uh, talk over them. So there's uh, Descartes was basically responding to Galileo. And well, bloody Mary, innit? You didn't mute. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to shout to you. I was like, you didn't mute. Throw someone at the door. So basically, um, so Galileo had uh, discovered what was referred to as the vacuum. And um, there was this whole discussion in philosophy at that time about, well, what is the vacuum? Is the vacuum nothing or not? And um, Descartes ends up responding to this idea that Galileo's discovered a vacuum. And his whole argument is basically that it can't be nothing because nothing has no qualities. And if there is space and dimension, even if there's no atoms there or particles or whatever it is, it still has to be something. It isn't nothing because it has dimension and if it has dimension then it must be some form of he, he uses the word substance but he's using it in a very loose sense he doesn't mean substance as we usually understand it now to be like things that you can knock on he's just saying by definition it can't be nothing because it has qualities it has dimension and i, I wrote an article talking about uh this sort of engagement that galileo wasn't even aware was happening um, it was really interesting, but yeah, so the idea that quantum things appear in quote unquote nothing, it's not that they're appearing in nothing at all. And you can also, if there are four dimensions, it's, um, it's, it could be that they're coming from another place and that that, that place just isn't up, down, left or right, but it's another direction that we can't point to in the same way that when I made reference to the flatlanders, so you've got these two dimensional creatures they live in a flat land and they're flat and they only know what forward, backwards, left and right are. And for them, they don't know what up and down is. So things coming into their vacuums from nothing would be something coming from up into their plane of existence. And then it would look like something appeared out of nothing for them. And in the same way, if there's a fourth dimension and we're in three dimensions, Things could come from this fourth dimension into our universe and they would appear and it looked like they come from nothing. But it's not necessarily the case um, if there's other directions. And you can't really negate the possibility of that. 
Um, but there's a whole discussion. Even atheists like Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, Carl Sagan entertain this as a possibility. They've got videos on it discussing it, um, as I've just described it. This is a good. Uh, Hamza, look up Dr. James Tor and his critique on primordial soup. He made a series on YouTube. That's a fancy way of saying magic custard. Magic custard, man. Magic custard. Uh, I'm trying to understand some of the words being used in the book, particularly panspermia. Yeah, what so the heck word. does that mean? I laughed in my head when I read that. Honestly, the, the it, basically, it basically means that um, human beings were planted here by some alien species. And that we there is no God in this worldview is the fact that we're just the product of um, we're being farmed basically. So I've got the definition here: the theory that it's pretty much what you said. The theory that life on Earth originated from microorganisms or chemical precursors of life present in outer. Oh wait, no, it's not necessarily aliens. The oh, theory no. that life on Earth originated from microorganisms or chemical precursors of life present in outer space and able to initiate life on reaching a suitable environment so like simple organisms that can travel through space like spores yeah. oh, okay. or something, landed on earth and then could evolve so, like oh, so it's, not, it's, not, it's not alien farmers then no okay no well it depends what you mean by alien farmers because like you know like spores have you seen how mushrooms work yeah they can host on little creatures like ants and stuff like that and they technically end up like it look looks a little bit like a farm the way they yeah, have, have you seen? Have you seen the uh, what's it called? Emerald wasp. What it does? Yeah, how it take control of a cockroach. Yeah, mind control. Uh, I have a question. Bushra Ali always has questions, and they're always mental. This one looks okay. Did you Hamza and did you Hamza and Yusuf read the book and finish it? No, no. No, no. So I read. End of I question. I read, I read. I think I read the first two chapters. I, I got quite. I got quite far actually. I got into uh, Goldilocks universe, I believe, and I was really enjoying it. I was. I'm the honestly, give me a little bit of knowledge, man. I started bashing people about with it, and it was really good, man. Really good information. So I can't wait to finish it. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I only got to chapter two. Oh no! I finished yeah. chapter two. I think. Oh, and we got, got this next. We got this next. Bro, you want to see the ones I've got? These are the ones I want to go through. Have you got thought... signature in the cell? No. We've got it at the Sapiens Library, so I could probably grab it if I'm, when hey, I'm in London. So I've got this one. Uh, the Hero's Journey. Okay. Which looks really cool. It's just about like a common archetype that goes through all the stories about what what who and what the hero is and everything and then there's a uh, 100 bad arguments oh, okay so 100 um, of the most uh, the 100 of the most important fallacies in western philosophy i've got the most important book we need to read <laughs> i need to get that one this... look at that yeah, apparently this, is... this book <laughs> this book answers my question that no Christian can answer. This one for a book, mate. Oh, there's this one as well. So that one, if you got enough of them, you could build houses with them. <laughs> like that. that it, it's, it, How it, many pages it, in yours? How many pages in yours? Let's see if it beats my one. So this one has... It's like top trumps this, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, one thousand one hundred. Oh wow! One thousand one hundred eighty-four. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. You did. You did your job. Uh, well, including the index as well, or not? Yeah, just all the pages. No, do it without the index because uh... the index is itself a book, mate. Yeah. Uh, yeah so there's the, the beginning of the index. So 1,016 without the index. Oh, mine's only 725 without the index. So that's the the <laughs> index there. So the index is like... But I do need to read this book, isn't it? Don't you think? I just... yeah, yeah. You should read generally. To know why, why <laughs> this guy, whoever he is, what's his name? That one looks good. I don't know if you read that one. I got this one second hand. No, I haven't. What did Jesus really say? The five Gospels. <laughs> So there's a whole commentary about what can actually be attributed to Jesus, which looks really interesting. 
<laughs> just listen to this. Listen to this for a description. Questions about the reliability of the New Testament are commonly raised today, both by biblical scholars and popular media. Drawing on decades of research, Craig Blomberg addresses all of the major objections to the historicity of the New Testament in one comprehensive volume. Topics addressed include the formation of the Gospels, the transmission of the text, the formation of the canon, alleged contradictions, the relationship between Jesus and Paul, supposed Pauline forgeries and other Gospel miracles and many more. Historical corroborations of details from all parts of the New Testament are also presented throughout the historical reliability of the New Testament. <laughs> I have to read this nonsense. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so but right. I'm, what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and go through these. Um, I might just make like an off, off the line. So I'll read it and then I'm going to try and do notes and stuff of what I'm reading. And then I'll upload them rather than do them live. But this one looks good. Um, just the arguments, 100 of the most important arguments in Western philosophy. So like the first chapter is just on philosophy of religion. And it talks about Aquinas' five ways, the contingency cosmological argument, the Kalam argument for the existence of God, the ontological argument. Pascal oh, that Rieger. sounds good. That sounds yeah, like a good book. This one's really good. And then it doesn't just talk about philosophy of religion. So part one's philosophy of religion. Part two is metaphysics. Part three, epistemology. Uh, part four, ethics. Part five, philosophy of mind. Part six, science and language. And then I've got the ethics toolkit, which I'm really looking forward to going through. Because this basically just goes through all of the you know, sort of stuff that you need to know to become familiar with ethics. And it's really nice as well. So I could do like a video on each. Oh, that'd be really cool. Summarize. summarize um, the most Ali's got another question. What, what is your thought about the title of the book? Perfect. See, yeah, it's descriptive, isn't it? It's exactly what the book is. Exactly what it says on the tin. That's the conclusion is that it's trying to bring that. that what, what, see, the whole point of the book, Bushra, is to determine the um, the origin of the universe, and is there anything behind it, or is it all randomness? So, what what he does in the book, he starts with his judo Christian idea, then he shows how the scientist science starts to collapse the judo Christian idea, and then. Um, so the, uh, the the main thesis or hypothesis for the universe rolls into the realm of the new atheists again. And then, of course, what he's doing now is bringing back the God hypothesis, the God theory as to the origination of the universe. So, yeah, the book is the, the title is perfect. Hamza, will we ever cover apostolic succession? Uh, apostolic succession. Is that, I'm assuming that's to do with the church fathers and that I'm assuming. With regards to Orthodox Christianity and um, Catholics and all that, so probably. Uh, how long have we been streaming for? Uh, I know that's probably a good place to leave it. To be honest, yeah, you think so? Yeah, you don't want to keep them too long. Um, D these guys love you. I love them. The opportunity to ask use of ponders questions is next level. No, I'm not. I'm this. I'm new to this. So this, by the way, I, I'm, I don't. What's that? I'm gonna be going on this journey with all of you. I'm not. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I like the way that we're gonna uh, be breaking down, breaking it down, and even working out how to utilize it. You know, this is the key. You see, it's not just about reading a book and that's it, and that's what you know the book. It's about what what can we take from this book, and how can we use it in our dawah going forward, and how, how in our interaction with atheists. Trust me, if you guys get this knowledge. The key bullet points, you, you'll collapse any argument with an atheist. Or you'll at least you'll demonstrate that your belief in what you believe is a rational, reasonable position. Whether they accept it or not as their position is irrelevant. But the fact is they will not be able to say your position is irrational unless they can describe the what is irrational about it. And obviously they can't. Let's go on to the comments. Are we flexing books? I can't go near Yusuf when it comes to flexing. I got a few bits and pieces around, but I, I've not read most of mine, to be honest. I just I got loads of bursaries in uni, and then just spent them all on books, and then just haven't had the time to read. This is a good book. Oh, Muhammad in the Bible by uh, Professor Ab Abu Abdullah Dawood. The writer of the present series of articles is the former Reverend David Benjamin Keldani, a Roman Catholic priest of the U Unit Chaldean sect, 
A brief sketch of his biography appears elsewhere. When asked how he came to Islam, he wrote, my conversion to Islam cannot be attributed to anything other than the gracious direction of the mighty Allah. Without the divine guidance of learning, search and other efforts to find the truth may even lead one astray. The moment I believed in the absolute unity of God, his holy apostle Muhammad Sallallahu became a pattern of my conduct and behavior. But he's what an ex- huh? What was the author called? He's called, um, his, he used to be called David Benjamin Kaldani. His name's uh, Abdul Abdullah Daoud. It's not on Amazon. Former Bishop of Aramia. Um, book was written in 1987. I found it. The one argument I found in this was the argument about the Shiloh. Because when you ask a Christian who the Shiloh is, um, they say it's Jesus, and uh, in in the book, it, it, in the Bible, it says the prophethood and the royal scepter shall remain in the house of David until the Shiloh comes. Then all dominion will be with him. And when you ask them who the Shiloh is, they can't say. If you say it's Jesus, then you say, well, he can't be the Messiah then, because Jesus is from the house of David. And this prophecy says that when the Shiloh comes, the prophethood will leave the house of David. So the question you need to ask yourself in history, which prophet came outside of the lineage? And there's only one man in history, Muhammad Sassam. Yeah, alhamdulillah, I'll check that one out. That's a good book. Someone just said that. You guys fetch your books with a thousand pages. I can't even finish my 60 page Rhinoceros success book. When you finish your Rhinoceros success book, you need to read hey. Advanced Rhinocerosology. I've not even read that. <laughs> I've not even started. I do want to. It's, this one's uh Oh, wow. So it's a history of Christianity and it goes through. It's obviously, it's a huge history. It's like 2000 years. So it's it, Even though it's this big, it's probably glossing over everything. Um, but yeah. This is going to be a fun book to tackle at some point. And let me just answer Gabriel's question while you're doing that. Gabriel, yeah, every Monday, inshallah, 9.30. You all right with 9.30? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah it, it, it's only, huh? Depending on how things go, if as long as it works, it, then we can do every Monday. But if things get a bit hectic, yeah. it might have to be every fortnight or something. It's Hamza's den. They get, they get what they're given. It is what it is. <laughs> But I, I think every fortnight sometimes can be nice as well, but we'll see how we get on. We, we'll start with um, once a week. Yeah, I if think, we do I think once we'll, every fortnight, it'll take ages. We'll, look, we'll start with once a week. We'll see how the viewings go. If the viewers start dropping, then we realize no one's interested or they're not interested. And then we can um, go back to playing games. No, people will probably drop off anyway because that's the nature of these things. That, um, people like to start things and no one ever finishes them. Um, yeah. So even if people do drop off, I don't think we should stop reading. No, but I think I, I think the uniqueness of the members only chat. I think you'll find that these guys they like to take advantage of being members. Do you get me? They, they, they yeah. like to lord it. I mean, green. Do you get me? So any opportunity for a members only stream, green. guys are here, man. Alhamdulillah. And of course, it's not just reading a book. It's chatting with you, asking questions, interacting. So and it, it's, you know, you don't always get a chance to do that unless you go to Sapiens Lighthouse. Yeah? Is that what it is? is it? Rap, rap. Yeah, Sapiens institute.org forward slash lighthouse one-to-one -one conversations if you're a muslim suffering from doubts someone interested in islam we had someone take the shahada yesterday or yesterday the day before oh mashallah i need a i spoke to him like a year ago and then he just emailed randomly and said he wanted to so keep him in your dua everyone may allah keep him firm i mean inshallah can yusuf members join too no <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't it's youtube who decides isn't it see, this is see my big problem i've got right now patrons can't even get involved how do you i get can patrons you can oh ah not this way I, if i do it the other way they can if i make it a members only stream but then i send a link out to patrons they can join the stream but then the the, the non-members don't get to watch the stream unless i suppose they can watch it as a video later You've got a minimum one though, haven't you? It's like three pound ninety nine or something. Two ninety nine, man. I've only got one membership. That's it. Two ninety nine. Become a member. Go green. Get the emojis. Get participating. These. I've been promising this for ages. You get me. Yeah. 
I feel so stupid when I say a book. We haven't read the books. We haven't read the books. Don't worry. We oh, that looks a good book. I I make myself feel stupid because I, I get these books and then I don't bloody read them. Is that have you seen that meme with the the, the guy? He's walking down the road with his girlfriend or his wife, and uh, and she's looking at him dead angry, and he's like looking back at another girl. And he's like. Oh. And then the, the, the girl's just like not completely oblivious that anything's going on behind her. And the meme is um, the girl that looks angry, the wife, is uh, my old books that I haven't read yet. And then the guy looking back is me. And then the other girl is uh, new books that I want to buy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so well like I've got, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I've not bought them, but I just like my Amazon basket at the moment has something like 22 books in really i've not bought them i'm just looking did, at do you do a wish list them. on your channel uh I've, I've got a wish list i don't put it on my channel though so who do you show your wish list to no one it's, it's i look at it and go oh yeah i'm, I'm gonna get that but one. isn't a wish list suppose you put your wish list up there and people will say oh right, i'll get you that Brilliant. uh I, I i think the people have done that it's just i've, I've never bothered to be honest have you seen Apostate Parasite's wish list? Cameras and lights and all sorts of Oh, uh, yeah, it's a fun one. Well, I've, I've got my, my Patreon and my YouTube members, and they, they give me a humble amount. So I'm, I'm happy. And I've got a, a good little crowd as well. Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. Uh, nice, a nice. So, fun. where do you do your book club for the people who want to um, get involved? Uh, Discord. I'll get the link. One sec. Do they have to be members on your channel? Yeah. No. Uh, not anyone can join the book club, but I'm extremely strict. So be wary. You it's, you, you don't just walk in willy nilly and just be like, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. No, there's uh, you've you've got to go through a process. So you have to read the rules, and you have to actually read the rules because if you don't, I know you've not read the rules. And I'm not telling you how I know, but I know. And so people <laughs> that don't read the rules don't get in. Because I don't like laziness. And that way I have like a serious bunch of people. Uh, it's small. It's only got like 200 and odd members on. Um, and most of them are not that engaging anyway. So I might purge a lot of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just I just want it to be like a small group of engaging people um, that are chilled. And it's nice. There's never drama. The, the, the Discord is closed most of the time until book club starts and then I open it and then we read and then I close it again and so you can't talk there's maybe one chat that's open but the discussion is strictly for the book that we're reading you can't talk about other things no hey you know what was, what was the weather like where you are or did anyone see the game none of that it's discussion about the book which at the moment is uh that the Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn, which is a, a book on the philosophy of science. Um, and it's an amazing book so far. Can, can you explain how to join your book club? Uh, so you click this link. And then you read the rules. And then you message to let us know you've read the rules. And then I know if you have or not. Um, so do that. Oh, I'm going to be busy now, keeping an eye on the thingy. <laughs> You're People going to get mobbed now, bro. Yeah, well, someone's just jumped on already. Mohammed is quick on the mark. Layla, Layla's on. We've got two. Have the rules? We don't know yet. We'll find out. Oh, crap. It's going to be hard now because everyone's going to be able to. Okay, let's see who can crack the rules so that you can join his book club without reading the rules. Let's see if we can work out the enigma. No, 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 none of that. <laughs> Let's yeah. see if we can ascertain what his process is. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to... Or for not. The, for the time or being... is that just a bluff? Is that just a bluff? We no, no, know. for the time being, then, what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to stop everyone's ability to write so that it doesn't happen while we're alive. Okay. So everyone that's joining now... By the way, I kick loiterers as well. So if you come into the book club and you just sit in the welcome page and you don't engage, you don't read the rules, you don't say you've read them or anything, you get kicked. And you can join back on if you've been kicked, um, but you've got to actually 
read the rules and say you've read them. Um, and if you don't, and you just sat there as a visitor in the welcome area, just like loitering about, you get kicked and off. You can't just enjoy the show. You've got to actually participate. In the welcome page, at least, because then I know what it is, is it gets rid of lazy people who are just joining for the sake of joining. Like serious people will read the rules and they'll do what the rules tell them to do. And then I'll know that they've read the rules. Ah. And uh, I'll put the L man. And what, what day did you do your book club? Uh, every Sunday at 1 p.m. 1 p.m.? Yeah, UK time. Okay, so there you go, people. Once I finish my live on a Sunday... And uh, you could jump straight into user book. So my auto message is saying, do this now uh, or you'll get kicked for loitering. <laughs> uh, you won't get kicked yet because I've turned off the ability to send messages and then I'll turn them on again. Um, and then I'll probably just send messages to each person one at a time, letting them know. Hey, how that. did she do? Hey. <laughs> um, I know Layla didn't read the rules. <laughs> How's she messaging? I thought I turned off the ability. Hmm. Bush was asking, is there any personal questions to join? Say again? You, Bushra is asking, is there any personal questions to join your book club? No, there's no personal questions. It's just agree or not agree. Um, but technically, you shouldn't have been able to have even wrote that. All right, don't be cheating now. In Layla's the comments, claiming right she now. did read. They're going to well, troll you, you, bro. They're going <laughs> to. She didn't read because she didn't do what the the rules told her to do. So how how did you read? So how have you done a sneaky? How have you read it then, Layla? And then yeah. didn't act upon it, or did you read it but not do what it said to act she... like you didn't read it? How are, you, are you like? Are, are you are you channeling Dawkins that? Um, Intelligent design is sorry, uh, random mutation is imitating intelligent design. One sec, everything's going bloody chaotic now. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> my, my evening is now going to be trying to get all of this sorted. Oh, Layla read the rules this time, did she? Corey says, are non-Muslims welcome in your book club, Ponders? Yeah, anyone's welcome. Corey, are you a Muslim or not? So long as you're not a douche. Oh, bloody hell, I thought I turned off the... All right, what's that? Uh, Brother Hamza, I have a question. I sent a co-worker to emails about Islam containing Dawah and she ignored me. I have since left that workplace. Should I message her on Facebook? <laughs> Yusuf, what would you advise, mate? Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't paying attention because I've uh, got a million people joining. I sent a co-worker two emails about Islam containing dawah and she ignored me. I have since left that workplace. Should I message her on Facebook? <laughs> no, leave her, man. Like if... God. Look, to be honest with you, you know, people, you know, you don't just give dawah to the sky, okay? If people come in your sphere of influence, that's who you should be. Unless you, if you're doing street dawah, it's a different story. But when it comes to people you work with and around, don't force it upon them. You go, you come across as a nut job. Just relax. Bring the conversation. If they're interested, they are. They're not. They're not. You can't force people to talk about what you want to talk about. It's like me going up to Jordan trying to tell him about the football and who we transferred where and who did what. Jordan's not interested in hearing about football. And I keep going on, yeah, yeah. And I message him, yeah, you know what, Man United, yeah, they won last night. It's like, is they interested? So save your energies, bro, because you might get demoralized yourself. I've got a feeling a lot of people haven't had to read the rules now. You haven't had to? <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, just so you know, the rules are important because if you break them, you get kicked. And uh, so make sure you abide by them. I don't run no democracy up in this place. I am a tyrant. <laughs> and I do kick. Uh, if people so are you me. saying now they're acting like they've read the rules when they haven't? Well, they technically could do because everyone's just like doing the thing <laughs> before I have a chance to like hide the thing. Uh 
Yeah, so ugh, chaos. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a job tonight. Yusuf, anyway. there is a violation of the rules within the rules. What? The rules undermine themselves. How? How how has that happened? Ahmed bin Mohammed, come and tell us all about it. Actually, no, I can't put the link out because everyone will jump on them. Oh, there we go. There is one use of acronyms. Acron What's wrong with acronyms? <laughs> I don't, do, do I have a rule that says don't use acronyms? Have I not well, read the rule? The rule, <laughs> the rule says don't use acronyms. <laughs> what? Are you saying the rule is don't use acronyms and then you use acronyms? I think it's more specific. I've, I've, it's been ages since I've read them myself. What's an acronym for the people at home? Acronym is just like a shorthand. So, you know, if you want to say go rap rather than arguments for God's oneness, revelation, prophethood, go rap okay. is like the acronym. Um, oh, yeah, no, the, the acronym for swearing. So, like LMAO. Yeah. As an example, I don't like people using that because it's, yeah, you know what I mean. Or, or if someone puts the the letter F in one of the acronyms, we know what it means, and when you read it, you bloody you say it in your head. So my my daughter's got a habit at the moment of using the word fish. What the fish? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know I don't what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do, do, do you stop that or do you, do you stop that encourage that or would you no do? I, don't, I don't mind like childish words so like if you say frick or yeah. like gosh darn it or you know like th those kind of things I'll uh, if someone happy. said if someone said to you what the fish you're talking about what the flipping heck no what Maybe. the fish you're talking about uh, fish no I probably wouldn't really get angry about that although See in my daughter's head in my daughter's head she's swearing. <laughs> For fish's sake. <laughs> so hey, Fez is up, Fez is happy. Uh, Fez has read the rules, a bit disappointed, was expecting more. I'm gonna have to complexify them now. Because it feels like everyone's got them. Oh my God, to you know, like I have to trust like all your rules to understand what I'm gonna agree on. <laughs> you have to get a Theosaurus out, is it? What I might have to do is just tell people to... Did Mohammed Ijab help you compile your rules? Email me some... No, he didn't, no. I might make it so that someone's got to email me a particular code word or something. What about this one? LMSO, laughing my socks off. Are you all right with that? Yeah, socks are cool. I don't mind. LMHO, laughing my Fe hijab off. Fez says, I formally rebel and reject the rules. I oh he used this uh, the CBA. <laughs> Jordan M says, "What in the book club are you on about?" <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, to keep up with book club, but Yusuf is a lovely guy, oh. and I wish him the best. Thank you, Fez, and uh, I'll kick you now. <laughs> oh, he left. <laughs> he left. There we go. All right. Uh, so All right, so. We encourage people to go buy the book or download the PDF. Yeah, but buy the book. Buy the book. Forget PDFs. Yeah, yeah, no, buy the, the book. book. It's the quite book. expensive book, though, isn't it? No. But mind you, this, this could well be a long time reading anyway. You want to see and... an expensive book? Oh, no. It's coming now. I got that. So my, some guy passed away. Uh, um, and he gave all of his library to the university or to one of the lecturers at the university and then I ended up uh, the, the teacher gave me a load of the books and some of them have got receipts in so like this one and this isn't even like one of the most expensive but this one's called the 20th century philosophy Edinburgh Companion to and the receipt's still in there. £120. Wow. Just, for, just for that one book. We bought a book from America 
um it was jesus in the angel or something like that it cost us 250 dollars what the hell honestly academic books are quite expensive generally like they can be really because no, not many people buy them so they put the cost up and then because it's like the budget of the university